All right. Well, welcome everyone. We're at the last segment of the Modern American History uh, course. This is uh, chapter 32 in the Tyndall and She book, if you're following along with the narr um, American narrative history. Uh, I have always um, stated that this is um, quite an interesting chapter because it's pretty much my um, uh, most of my adult life so far. So uh, welcome to 21st century America, or as I like to call it, um, the perpetual pain in my ass. But anyway, um, uh, we're going to be going into the different uh, areas of what's what we now refer to as the turn of the 21st century. And um, so the United States is definitely having a surge of new kinds of people. The demographics here has the United States reaching 306 million people by 2010 in the last census that has been done. Most of the growth in population occurred in areas that had a mild climate and low taxes. Uh, women continued to enter the workforce and the traditional family continued to decline. Uh, during the 1990s, the foreign-born population grew to 31 million people, averaging 100,000 new immigrants a year. Um, the increasing of numbers of Chinese uh, risked their savings and their lives to gain entry into the United States. And these uh, illegal immigrants were trying to keep warm in this picture that we see here. Uh, after being forced to swim ashore when the freighter that carrying them to the United States ran aground in Rockaway Beach, New York. And this was in June of 1993. Uh, and these newer immigrants coming from mostly Latin America and, and Asia are in, in some ways a, a change in how America approaches um, immigration as well. And we'll go over that in a little bit of detail. So there was a prolonged economic recession and it's really not entirely fair to look at it in the 1990s in that way now uh, compared to the last recession that we were in. It was really quite mild in comparison. The difference was that um, the, that the unemployment numbers uh, were, in, in my opinion, unusually large, uh, even though they were quite small in comparison to other countries, but there was what we refer to as the downsizing movement. I myself was downsized out of a couple of jobs. But essentially what was happening, and it, this may or may not make sense, but uh, first it was in blue collar jobs. So American manufacturers, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to com be competitive with foreign manufacturers, started to uh, replace workers with automation. So uh, robotics started to be integrated into the assembly line. A lot of uh, heavy production for some companies, even American companies, was moved to overseas uh, areas where there would be cheaper labor costs and fewer uh, regulations. <clears throat> this uh, picture that you see here were people protesting the North American Free Trade Agreement. And this is because, um, uh, particularly uh, adding Mexico to the uh, treaty, permitted uh, many American manufacturers to move some of their manufacturing to Mexico, which had much cheaper workforce. And so a lot of uh, American blue-collar jobs were lost. And this started in the 1980s, but really came to a conclusion in the 90s. But what made the 90s especially uh, different was that um, <clears throat> the um, it started to affect white-collar workers. And this had to do with the fact that the computer age was now doing a lot of the elements of office work that used to be done by actual people, whether it was proofreading documents or scanning checks for details or filing information for future uses. Uh, this was the this was what people did, you know. And but then you know, literally tens of thousands of what we would now call white collar workers are going to lose their jobs. And this isn't a normal uh, type of recession in the sense that the downsizing was was sort of temporary, that the workforce was just basically being laid off because times were tough. And as soon as things were good, they're going to be hired back again. The fact of the matter is their jobs were eliminated. So these are uh, people who have to find a new source of income. And this is uh, what I refer to as displaced occupation. 
And this is very difficult to do. And if you're in your 40s or 50s at this time, which a lot of them were, um, you know, you had to essentially be okay with a major cut in salary and a somewhat uh, humiliating re-entry at, a, at the bottom level and working your way back up again. And this became rather difficult. Now, um, the Republican Party that really seemed unified and together in the 1980s starts to split under George H.W. Bush. And and that has largely to do with the fact that uh, George H.W. Bush was much more of a moderate. And so some of the uh, religious conservatives felt that George uh, H.W. Bush was was not, uh, if I, for lack of a better word, conservative enough. And so uh, there's going to be a um, sort of like a, a rebellion of sorts from what are referred to as the uh, religious right. And so, uh, but in my opinion, what really affected George H.W. Bush the most was the independence uh, growth in the United States. And this was a guy named Ross Perot, who apparently hated the Bushes his whole life. Um, uh, he was a Texas billionaire who... Um, basically had uh, decided that the United States had had uh, too much debt and it needed to kind of uh, reinvent itself, so to speak. And so um, he ran as a third-party candidate, gaining about 19% of the popular vote. And this was enough in very key states to um, push the election to a new candidate, uh, uh, William Jefferson Clinton or Bill Clinton. So the democratic resurgence was really about two things. Uh, f- first and foremost is the fact that Ross Perot could pull enough votes away from uh, George H. W. Bush to to give Clinton the victory, but also um, because, by the way, Bill Clinton only won forty three percent of the popular vote, so he he didn't win a majority of the votes in nineteen ninety two. But it's also the fact that um, the Bill Clinton and a lot of other people in the movement. Uh, were moving the Democratic Party to the center, what uh, Clinton referred to as the third way. And this was the Democratic Leadership Conference. And this was a group of uh, Democrats who believed that um, the recent elections for the Democrats were a disaster because they kept going towards more uh, radical candidates on the far left, George McGovern being just one example, but also Walter Mondale, for instance. And so... Clinton decided that the focus had to be on the economy. And in fact, the, his uh, campaign manager, James Carville, was famous for having uh, said that there was a sign in, the, in his main uh, campaign that said, it's the economy, stupid. And what Clinton did is he tapped into the anxiety that a lot of American workers were having at the fact that, you know, they were losing their careers, not their jobs, their careers. And there's a lot of insecurity that comes from this uh, feeling that, you know, you, you, you're you not in control and that there's something that um, had to be done to keep, keep you, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sort of above water. And, and Clinton was able to tap into that and make that his, his deal. And then, of course, um, that was health care reform. Uh, one of the biggest fears for somebody who has lost their job, and, I'm, and again, right, these are people who lost their job forever. The jobs are gone. Um, it's one thing to have to go and transfer careers and retrain yourself. It's another to do all of that and to be worried about your health care, because in the United States, health care is paid for by through your employer. And uh, if you've been laid off or displaced, uh, you now don't have insurance and you have to go looking for a job. And a lot of entry level jobs don't have insurance, especially if it's the new startups that were uh, coming around in the 1990s. There just wasn't, you know, they weren't offering health care. And so this was a, a, another source of insecurity and anxiety, and Clinton said that he would be able to actually fix that. The problem for um, President Clinton, however, was that his uh, focus on health care kind of created a distraction. So for a lot of uh, younger students in the course, uh, you may be wondering why there's such negative feelings toward the Clintons or uh, 
Hillary Clinton, for instance, part of it is this uh, health care reform, which became known as Hillary Care. And that's because the, this new president decided to put his wife, the first lady, an unelected person in charge of health care reform. She proceeded to um, meet with uh, people in private. She did not make uh, proceedings uh, transparent for a lot of people. And in the process, put together a rather convoluted uh, democratic plan for a government takeover of the healthcare system. And this uh, was, in a sense, uh, kind of like the the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of Americans. And and remember, right, sometimes new presidents um, miscalculate their mandate. So uh, similar to John F. Kennedy... Uh, who won by just the narrowest of margins, 100,000 votes across the entire country. Uh, Bill Clinton was uh, Bill Clinton was elected with only 43 percent of the popular vote and very co- much concentrated in specific states. And yet he went into office assuming as though the American people were ready for really uh, radical change to the system in order to to help. And the fact is they they weren't. So in the midterm elections. Right. Uh, so we get what your textbook and what I refer to as a Clinton overreach. So he, he misreads his mandate. And in 1984 midterm elections, the Democrat lost control of Congress for the first time since the 1980s. And it's really the first time they lost both houses since the 1920s. So it was a major uh, fallback. Right. So the. Um, the new Republicans were led by Newt Gingrich and campaigned for what was referred to as a contract with America. It was a 10-point outline promising the voters that the Republicans would accomplish in, once in office. Now, um, it, it, I'd like to just clarify, you know, I, the way I remember it, because I voted, was that they, the Republicans, this was about the Republicans getting the majority and that they would promise to have a vote on these things. And now, I think it's really important to remember that um, uh, with a Democratic president, it would require his signature or a two-thirds majority for an override, which the Republicans will never have. So when the text talks about however much uh, that most of their plans went undone, there's really only one thing that the on that list that they never voted on, and that was term limits, and that's a shocker. Uh, But anyhow... Uh, Congress enacted legislation ending the open guarantee of welfare for all who asked and limited the amount of time a person could remain in the program. Now, um, this is uh, sometimes referred to as uh, the Gingrich revolutionaries, these group of people. And your textbook wants to make it sound like they had this sort of like draconian, anti-social spending kind of thing. And it's probably important to remember that our authors are, are pretty much on the, in the Marxist world school, and which is fine, uh, but uh, they're going to, to see the, all of this as, as a major downplay. But one has to remember that Bill Clinton signed this legislation, and he was a Democrat. So where I believe, um, in my opinion, Clinton was a gifted politician and earned his name of the comeback kid was that he signed on to some of this legislation. And rather than sit home and think, oh my gosh, I just got murdered in these midterm elections. I'm, you know, In fact, one reporter asked him at one point, are you still relevant? Which was rude. But anyway, uh, you know, he went, in my opinion, he did exactly the right thing. He went into his office with his, uh, with his uh, advisors and said, look, here's this list of 10 things. What things can we get on board with and get, get ahead of this curve? Right. So and um, and this mattered. So, um, you know, he goes through this and he signs on. We get balanced budgets. I don't care what, you know, some of your more conservative friends will say. The Republicans and the Democrats, right, the, the Republican Congress and a Democratic president work together to balance the budget for the first time in decades and to actually start going into a surplus by the end of the decade. And that's, uh, you know, that's an amazing accomplishment for whatever reason. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why the American people rewarded 
Clinton with re-election in 1996 when pretty much everybody thought that he'd be just a one-term president. And he improved his popular vote, although only by three points, and he was still not elected by a majority of Americans. Uh, and and so um, his opponent, Bob Dole, who was a very re- respected and revered man in Washington, was not a very, um, let's say, colorful person. And his running mate, Jack Kemp, who was also very well-known and popular, uh, put on the ticket, I believe, in part to try to win back California. But the, the Republicans in 1996 thought that there was a chance that they could uh, win back the, the Republican uh, majority in the, in the state of California and, and win those electoral votes. And that, of course, did not happen. It was not a very wide margin of loss, but it was a loss. But uh, Jack Kemp, a former uh, quarterback for the San Diego Chargers, uh, tried really hard to um, uh, get Californians to jump on board, but it, it was to no effect. But um, the new economy proved to be uh, a hard thing to deal with. And, uh, and what's going to happen is this new economy is going to involve something called globalization. And this is a trend uh, that's actually quite old. One could study globalization by going all the way back to the medieval period when people literally on foot walked products through the Silk Road. Um, it's, it's, you know, even precedes that, right? The, the Mongol hordes and all those other people who just traveled the world and, and, and created an interconnected uh, global environment. But the modern globalization effort really starts with the era of exploration and keeps going for a long time. But what had happened was uh, prior to World War II, uh, international trade barriers, mostly tariffs, had caused what's referred to as a beggar thy neighbor situation and uh, really exacerbated the, the Great Depression and put a lot of economic pressure on countries like Germany and Italy and Japan, which you know obviously became a bit of a problem for the rest of the world. And so after World War II, there was something referred to as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT. Today it's referred to as the World Trade Organization. And starting in 1947, countries began to lower their tariffs and other barriers to trade. Well, in the 1980s, the belief was that these these barriers need to be brought down to the absolute minimum possible. In the in the United States, as I mentioned just a few minutes earlier, uh, actually signed on to a North American Free Trade Agreement, which eliminated barriers between the Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And this globalization, while it really created a revolution in both pricing and what I would believe is inflation is uh, also very troubling for people who are in uh, outdated or transferable careers. A great example of that is today it's possible for me to get a program uh, put together and work with people in India, Botswana, the United States, Switzerland, Cuba, right? I could just sit there and work with all of them right from my home. And so I don't need to hire people right here where I am, located in the United States, I can hire people all over, which means I can go to the most talented person at the lowest possible price. I personally believe that this is why inflation has not been the kind of problem that it's been in the past, because uh, wages are, while they are growing recently, they're still growing at a rate that's not excessive, and that's because I believe that the globalization. But again, if you are someone who is in a career that can be uh, outsourced, if you will, then uh, you struggle more. And this creates a lot of problems in the Clinton administration, um, just like a lot of administrations, by the way, didn't know quite how to put that together. So uh, the, the next thing that becomes an issue then is, how does one deal with this um, in a way that helps people who were already in disadvantaged situations. And by that, I mean women, minorities, uh, the disabled. And so these kinds of things um, uh, were really starting to uh, compound with each other. So there's a Supreme Court case in 1995 that ruled against affirmative action. 
and it required that the programs had to be really narrowly tailored in order to serve a compelling national interest. So what you had to do is you couldn't just say, oh, we're going to create diversity because diversity is really cool. You had to do it because, look, there is a real trend of a problem here and we need to fix it. And th this uh, creates a lot of confusion because now somebody could, with the perfectly good intentions doesn't quite know exactly how to slice the pie. And this created even more problems. Um, but... For Clinton, that agenda, which he really wanted to be his main agenda, um, really gets bogged down by the numerous number of scandals that um, that you know, uh, let's say, dogged the Clinton administration. If you read the text, you're going to get a rather short list. Of problems and and it can lead one to believe that uh, you know either Clinton was uh, pretty much a good guy who did everything he was supposed to do and got caught up in a bad sexual situation, um, or was the victim of a um, you know politically driven uh, you know assassination plot, if you will. The fact of the matter is, it's a little bit of both and and. In my opinion, the Clintons brought a lot of it on themselves just by their carelessness and their, um, uh, you know, just their kind of silliness. Uh, but there were many, many. There was the Whitewater scandal. There was the Filegate scandal. There was the um, Travelgate scandal. There was all sorts of things that were going on. But what's most important in, in my perspective is that... Um, Clinton had been dogged for a number of years with um, allegations of, um, at the time, what was referred to as womanizing. Today, we would refer to him as a sexual predator, in my opinion. Uh, there was a, um, during the primary season in 1992, Clinton was almost pushed out of the race because of a woman named Jennifer Flowers, who claimed that she had been in a 10 to 12 year affair with him. And he denied it all, and his wife uh, insisted that you know she was uh, not the kind of woman who would quote stand by her man, uh, but that you know they they worked through their marriage and they did what they were supposed to do, and the American people, uh, uh, thanks mostly to a twenty minute program on uh, sixty minutes that gave the Clintons a chance to sort of uh, renounce the whole thing and denounce uh, Jennifer Flowers. He was able to uh, bounce back in, which started the whole Comeback Kid label. And because the National Organization of Women stood by him through all of this, uh, Clinton is going to sign into legislation a, a bill that allowed um, women in sexual harassment and sexual assault cases to uh, present what's referred to as a pattern of conduct, which you know, is a, a way of sh basically saying that a sexual predator, uh, you might not believe that he he conducted himself this way against me, but look at all these other situations and, and decide whether he has credibility or not. And so a woman named Paula Jones came forward as a, a former uh, Arkansas state employee claiming that Bill Clinton had uh, assaulted her in a hotel room uh, where he uh, tried to get her to perform oral sex on him. And uh, she filed a civil suit uh, Clinton uh, tried to uh, excuse himself from it because as president, he, quote, didn't have time to deal with these sorts of things. And the uh, Supreme Court uh, unanimously said, no, the president can, in fact, uh, uh, tackle this problem and run the country. Uh, and Paula Jones uh, was going to settle out of court until one of uh, Bill Clinton's um, advisors was on a Sunday talk show and es essentially uh, referred to uh, women like Paula Jones as a bimbo. Uh, I believe the words that one of them is James Carville, I believe, said, well, if you you know drag a uh, tractor through a trailer park, you're going to dig up somebody. And uh, Paula Jones then refused to settle and instead went forward with her lawsuit. And so um, what uh, our textbook tries to push off as a minor sexual uh, dalliance was in fact involved seven uh, Jane Doe's, as they were referred to, two of whom claimed that Bill Clinton uh, raped them. 
so when uh, the when the textbook talks about impeachment, they make it seem as though a, a t- basically innocent good guy got caught up in a lie about an affair he was having. But in um, in 1990s parlances, I think it's important to remember that uh, sexual harassment was a very big issue. And part of sexual harassment is something called a negative, or excuse me, a hostile work environment. And so in uh, many cases, in fact, I worked for a company when I was uh, in, in uh, human resources. And I, I knew about a guy who was having an affair with his secretary. It was perfectly consensual. But for the other secretaries and women that worked in his office, it created a hostile work environment because, you know, why weren't they getting the same attention and, you know, this sort of thing. And uh, when the special prosecutor, in this case, the independent counsel, uh, Kenneth Starr, found out uh, that there was an ongoing affair between the president and an, another woman while he was president of the United States, uh, this led to an additional communication. Uh, the Clinton administration tried to um, stonewall this uh, inquiry, and uh, Monica Lewinsky, who by this point had been uh, moved out of the White House to basically protect the president and put into a cushy job in the Pentagon, had been um, uh, spilling her guts to a colleague at the Pentagon named Linda Tripp. Uh, Mrs. Clinton and uh, the media and a, a good number of people will put Linda Tripp through the ringer quite badly. And uh, in fact, she ends up having to leave the job that she had and move to a different state and had to literally got a uh, plastic surgery in order to change her appearance. I mean, it's just really kind of scary. And so... Um, uh, what happened was Bill Clinton uh, asked Monica Lewinsky to lie about their relationship. When she was caught in that, she um, basically revealed that there was um, DNA evidence to collaborate the relationship. Bill Clinton, under oath, in a uh, federal civil civil suit, uh, lied under oath. Uh, this was after, of course, he um, admitted to the affair with Jennifer Flowers, which he had told the American people never happened. And so we have a situation where the, we get this, what is now referred to as Clintonese, and uh, the arrogance and sort of um, silliness about the Clintons. And, and for those of you who are younger, weren't alive during that period of time, maybe this will help to explain why in 2016 there were still a lot of Americans who weren't quite, quite ready to uh, um, give Mrs. Clinton um, her due. And what's really important, I think, to remember about this is that when Monica Lewinsky swore under oath that she did not have an affair with the president, the uh, judge in the Paula Jones case threw the case out because she basically felt that there wasn't, um, you know, that that this whole thing was becoming a joke, basically. And so Paula Jones never got her day in court which today I think uh, feminists would be outraged about, but at the time they saw it as a great victory for their man, Bill Clinton. Um, And this is why when feminists stand up today and make claims against um, men, it's a lot more difficult. So it's, and it's heartbreaking because there are legitimate claims out there. And this is, you know, really stems from this situation. I think it's also important to know that while B- Bill Clinton did survive, he was impeached by the House, but he was uh, exonerated by the Senate and did serve out the rest of his term, that when he left office, he actually did suffer punishment. Uh, he paid around a million dollars in fines and penalties. He surrendered his uh, license to practice law uh, for perjury. Uh, He essentially pled no contest or, you know, guilty uh, in in a way uh, to these charges after he left office. So um, uh, our textbook tries to be a little uh, light on that, uh, but, um, you know, they were basic Clinton supporters. So, you know, that's going to stand to reason. On the foreign policy front, the post-Cold War really did hold some hopes and dreams for the future. First and foremost, something referred to as the peace dividend, the idea that the United States could somehow 
uh, drastically cut defense budgets, which is a very large chunk of the discretionary budget. And that, um, you know, as these democracy movements were expanding all over the world, that this would be just an unbelievable time. In Haiti, for instance, right, a military coup uh, uh, was uh, struck to get rid of a democratically elected um, president whose name is Jean Bertrand Aristide, who was a former priest who was able to um, uh, uh, overthrow a military dictatorship that had existed for decades. But um, uh, but Aristide was returned to power, so democracy was looking as though it was existing in, in Palestine. And then in the Middle East, uh, Clinton was able to uh, get both the, um, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Here in this picture, uh, Clinton is standing between uh, the president of Israel on the left and Yasser Arafat, the founder of the PLO. And what's important here is uh, the 93 agreement provided for the restoration of Palestinian self-rule at the Gaza Strip in Jericho. And, and this was the beginning of a conversation about what is now referred to as the two-state solution. And, and to get there, the Palestinians had to agree to remove from their manifesto the uh, goal of wiping the Israelis off the map. And um, this is a, a pretty significant concession on the part of the Palestinians. And then in the Balkans, which has been a troubling area for, you know, Go back to the Crusades. I mean, it just never seems to end. Uh, but uh, the Balkans really implodes. So uh, the focus here is, is going to be in the former Yugoslavia. So um, so what happened is uh, the communist regime that had existed in Yugoslavia uh, fell apart. And then with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, communism as it's, at, at all just kind of fell away. Well, Yugoslavia was actually a confederation of multiple Slavic states. And uh, they were really not naturally a country. They had been slapped together after World War I, essentially as a reward to the Kingdom of Serbia, for perceived slights that they had received uh, from the Austrians and the Germans. And so uh, the Kingdom of Serbia was expanded into what became the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. After World War II, it became a, a communist dictatorship under General Tito, and that held the country together. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, most people uh, in the area did not hold the same sort of um, Yugoslavian national identity that Serbs had, because the Serbs uh, were uh, basically in majority control of the of the system. So when there was an ability for them to separate a number of these states, particularly Croatia, Bosnia Herzegovina, and Slovenia, uh, you know, basically openly declared their desire to to go on their own, to be independent, and this caused a huge ongoing battle that started under George H. W. Bush, and the, when the when the Europeans demonstrated a complete and utter failure to handle a problem in their own yard, the United States through NATO had to step in and try to keep the peace. Well, in '98, Serbia launched an attack against Kosovo, which is a province within within it. Uh, but was um, inhabited by mostly um, Albanian Muslims, or I should say Muslims of Albanian ethnicity. And the, um, the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, fought for independence. In 1999, the United States, uh, well, essentially what happens is the, uh, Bel uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Serbia refused multiple requests to stop attacking uh, Kosovars or El uh, Muslims in Kosovo. And when they failed to do so, Bill Clinton uh, gave the orders to bomb Belgrade, the capital of Serbia. And this brought an end to the hostilities. But the United States still has troops in Kosovo uh, where um, 
uh, the Serbs finally withdrew and created a what I'm going to call quasi-independent state of Kosovo. As I said, the United States and other NATO uh, powers have troops in Kosovo in order to protect them from outside attack. Uh, I will also mention uh, that this incident um, is one of the things that angered uh, the, the emerging leader in, in uh, Russia, who's Vladimir Putin. So uh, the, the issue here is that uh, Boris Yeltsin's Russia was, or I should say, say it did fall into a, a degree of chaos. Uh, prices collapsed. Uh, people's pensions were eliminated. Savings went completely out of value. And uh, Yeltsin, who was, I guess, at best a well-meaning, uh, benign alcoholic, uh, needed to find some stability, and he turns to a former KGB uh, director, or I should say agent, Vladimir Putin. And Putin saw this collapse as a complete calamity. In fact, um, it's telling, I think, that when he became president, he, men he mentioned specifically that the collapse of the USSR was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. And this is going to start Russia's uh, resurgence as a dictator dictatorial and um, international pariah. China, on the other hand, is uh, starting its emergence as a global economic player. And this is going to pose a different kind of threat to the United States, as China... Uh, basically promises to be part of the WTO in a very democratic and open system. As we well know now, in, in the 2000s, uh, China is basically using a spy network, not just for political and military purposes, but for also ec economic reasons, and uh, uh, doing various things to obtain technological advantage over economic competitors, particularly the United States and Europe and Japan. So, uh, one of the reasons that we currently see our, our President Trump right now uh, being a little uh, bit of a jerk with China, it's uh, pr not just really the, the tariffs that are the issue, it's the, the stealing of intellectual property that's been going on for the last 20 or 30 years by the Chinese. And so, um, uh, Clinton's... Uh, hold on the party, however, is going to be rather strong. He's the first Democrat to be elected to two consecutive terms uh, since FDR. So he's uh, a major figure in terms of power for the Democrats, and they're going to basically lean on him as the standard bearer of the party, really up until Barack Obama leaves office in, two, in uh, 2017. Um, and so... Uh, when we get the election of 2000, uh, the Democratic, Democrats uh, nominated uh, Clinton's vice president, Al Gore, and the Republicans nominated George Walker Bush, who was the governor of Texas. In the closest election in memory, Gore and Bush ended up without an electoral ma majority, and Florida's vote was in doubt. Uh, Gore sued Bush in state courts in Florida for a repeat of counting ballots, now, I think it's important to note, contrary to what's kind of spelled out in the text, um, the Gore campaign tried to pick which counties got recounted and only wanted counties with Democratic majorities to be recounted. Uh, and their continuous uh, push to do that, um, the Bush campaign sued the Gore campaign in a federal court. And what I think kind of gets uh, lost in the narrative is that the, um, the, the issue by the Supreme Court that seems to get uh, the anger of many people on the left um, is that, um, uh, you know, the Gore campaign was trying to cherry pick which voters got recounted. And if you follow the uh, Baker v. Carr decision, which is the one man, one vote standard established by the Supreme Court, it really does draw into question whether that was going to be followed. And so um, the Supreme Court finally uh, 
said that the uh, can't, you know, that Florida can't keep counting and that the Gore can't, can't, campaign can't insist that they recount votes until they get the result they wanted. And this created a lot of acrimony, a lot of people out there chanting, not my president, which I know a lot of people think is something that was new made up for Mr. Trump, but this is something that was done for George W. Bush as well, um, and uh, stoked quite a bit. And then there were people who called him President Select because they believed that he was actually given the presidency by the Supreme Court, and not by the people. So uh, the second Bush presidency, only the... Um, and now, up until even today, the sec, only the second son of a president to be elected president. Uh, Bush had to go into the Oval Office with a really zero mandate at all. And what happened is he succeeded in winning uh, cutting uh, taxes, but that's because of uh, what is somewhat referred to as the end of history. This was an article done by a guy named Eric uh, Fukuyama. And basically he believed that because the Cold War was over, that now there would be sort of like an end to history because uh, history was really about major conflict. And since there wasn't going to be any more major conflict, because gee, look, we're all on the same page, uh, it was the end of history. There was a conflicting one by uh, uh, a guy named uh, Samuel um, Huntington, who had written something called The Clash of Civilizations. This is again in the 1990s where he predicted that there was going to be a struggle now, a big one, between different types of uh, civilizations. And in it specifically, he's talking about Muslims uh, who are now going to you know, start to uh, push their agenda. Um, so in 2001, it, you know, Bush's first months in office, the dot-com industry basically went belly up. Uh, multiple companies who had been in the junk bond market for uh, almost a decade, uh, all of a sudden there was this enormous pricing bubble. And when they could could not demonstrate that they could actually make a profit, a lot of these people like cut their losses and ran. And this created a major drop. And in that environment, Clinton, or excuse me, I'm sorry, George Bush was able to get a, a passes done for tax cuts. And... Um, and budget cuts. And this was an attempt by Bush to grow the economy in a negative environment. Uh, but if you look at the situation, um, his his decisions on what to cut was really limited. And he, um, uh, you know, didn't really do it right, in my opinion. Uh, he just seemed to get on this social conservative agenda and tried to um, uh, make a space for what are referred to as neocons, or, which is short for neoconservatives. These are people who were, basically, they were in the hippie, anti-establishment movement in the 60s and 70s, but then they kind of grew up and realized, wow, I should really get a life. And, and so they believed that um, government could be a great vehicle for social change by pushing conservative values and that America could create better things around the world by promoting democracy and more specifically America's version of democracy and, and, and make the world a better place. And part of this was something referred to as no child left behind. And this is going to be really the first major uh, federal push into uh, elementary and high school education since um, Lyndon Johnson did this with the Head Start program and before that Eisenhower. This was the idea that all children should be able to read and do uh, math. And uh, in introducing this new legislation, President Bush uh, made the statement, and I'm paraphrasing uh, what he said, but that basically the greatest um, uh, version of prejudice is the um, prejudice of lowered expectations. Right, this idea that if some that you know white people would look at an African American or Hispanic and say, "Oh well, you know, they're probably just not going to be college ready," as if you know their ethnic background was somehow a, a predictor of their of their scholastic ability. And so uh, George Bush 
pushed for this money that would go to states in order to make sure that they were proficient at reading and math by 2014. And if a school was unable to meet these new guidelines, the state was supposed to take it over and mandate the changes. But again, here we get the perpetual problem with federal funding in these what were traditionally state issues. The federal government never provided a lot of money. And so what they did is they created a mandate on the states without sufficient funding. And so it created a frustrating environment in, where, in which teachers are being asked to accomplish these goals. But at the same time, there wasn't really a full... Uh, uh, accountability in terms of how much money was going to be spent and what it was going to be done with it and all the rest. But it did have these these um, restrictions in terms of goals that had to be met. And the uh, teachers unions fought this vigorously. And so um, uh, the next thing that uh, Bush pushed for is something called the faith-based welfare reform. And th this is a program that gets started and it's still in existence. Uh, the the uh, Obama administration chose to keep it. And this is uh, because uh, statistically, faith-based welfare agencies tend to get better results with lower income people with uh, less administrative cost. And this is because government agencies have to pay uh, their workers these very expensive pensions and health care benefits, and it makes the cost incredibly high and prohibitively high, in my opinion. And so by giving those same dollars to uh, private organizations, charities, uh, the government is able to get more people help with the same amount of dollars. And so um, this was really... In my opinion, this was supposed to be the Bush agenda. And if you actually listened to some of the Bush uh, people prior to going into the White House, so in the 1990s, these people were talking about a shrinking America. Uh, I remember Donald Rumsfeld had done a, a piece uh, for, I believe, Foreign Affairs magazine, where he talked about how you know we should maybe start thinking about uh, you know, pulling some of our people away from NATO, possibly getting out of Japan and South Korea, and that America could really take this peace dividend and just trajectories out into the future. Uh, Bill Clinton left us a budget uh, framework that predicted $2 trillion of surplus for the next 10 years, so going into 2011. So imagine that um, if that had held true, uh, in 2011, the United States debt would have been um, probably around $6 trillion instead of the $22, $23 trillion that it is now. It's quite a difference. So this, as I was saying, was really the intended agenda for the Bush administration. And then... 9-11 happened. For us today, for people who are, um, you know, my age or younger, this is the day of infamy. For people older than me, it was, uh, it was December 7th, 1941, the Japanese invasion uh, and bombing of um, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. So the war on terrorism is an interesting terminology. What many people thought was the end of history really became a new era of conflict. The biggest problem with the war on terrorism is that there's not a country or one army to put one's focus on. It's an ideology, and it's an ideology that spreads throughout the Muslim world and it becomes virtually impossible to predict exactly where and when these sorts of things are going to happen. And it's important, I think, to remember that when 9-11 occurred, many people, and particularly the media, were very quick to, in many ways, uh, 
blame the Bush administration that somehow they had missed the they had they had missed the mark that they had uh, probably knew of a potential strike but didn't take it serious enough that they weren't uh, taking uh, Islamic terrorism serious enough and that they had dropped the ball and that this had uh, created the worst uh, catastrophe in in modern American history and you begin to see that the Bush administration reverts to a Cold War mindset. And that's, those are my words. And so um, the reason why I came to that conclusion on my own is because what is referred to as the axis of evil speech. And this was an address that uh, George Bush made to the Congress in which he labeled North Korea, uh, uh, you know, Iraq and, and Syria as this new uh, source of evil. So what Bush was trying to do, in my opinion, was he was trying to make sure that he that there wasn't going to be a second terrorist attack on the United States. Um, I think that a man who was elected barely by essentially a Supreme Court decision that stopped what I believed was a foolish recount effort in Florida uh, really turned into... Uh, a major uh, problem. And so um, this becomes really difficult because it's not countries, it's an ideology. And so the Bush doctrine is in my in my position and what I feel, and this is the reason why probably I was so discouraged by the whole thing, is this ideology that the United States can somehow take on what's referred to in in military circles as a, as a preemptive strike position is kind of scary. And so uh, with the war in Afghanistan uh, came these new departments, the Office of Homeland Security, that gets created, and then the Patriot Act, which gave the government agencies the right to eavesdrop on suspected terrorists and try them in secret military courts. And, you know, the problem is Americans get caught up in this, you know, that uh, American citizens are going to be doing this. And so in 2002, Bush launched a a new policy, this Bush doctrine of preemptive attacks against nations that were viewed as being hostile to the United States. And this is um, this is shaky ground. And so when Bush urged the United Nations to confront Iraq about Saddam Hussein's actions toward the United States, uh, the UN did in fact pass a resolution demanding that Iraq disarm or face serious consequences. Hussein became you know, like kind of a cocky guy, thinking he could just play this off and and maximize the effect of it all. Uh, it backfires. Because uh, NATO, uh, under Bush's direction, decided that uh, you know that the UN was being too soft uh, when he didn't uh, come forward with disarmament. Uh, on March nineteenth, <clears throat> uh, Bush ordered U.S. troops, along with British forces, to go to go in, and within six weeks, the Iraqi war uh, was over. The so-called shock and awe. But the problem is, the second Persian Gulf War was really just the beginning of a, you know, of a um, destabilization effort, in my opinion. Uh, we're going to destabilize Afghanistan and Iraq and now Syria. We did it to Libya and uh, it, to a, a much lesser extent Egypt. I mean, this is just um, the kind of overreach in foreign policy that uh, requires such a huge government and certainly an enormous uh, military budget. So we get into what's referred to as mission creep. What started off as a punishment of Iraq turns into the rebuilding of Iraq. And again, this is what causes so much of the acrimony and hatred that that comes into the into the deal. And so if you look at this, um, sort of collage here, America at this point is quite literally the only superpower. And um, 
this could be the pinnacle of wonderful, and it can also be the yikes moment. And the reason why I put these two pictures here is because American hegemony has two sides to it. Uh, yes, as the upper picture in the left shows, women in Afghanistan were quite literally liberated by NATO forces and given a chance to, um, you know, literally breathe outside their home without the fear of execution because they were wearing the wrong clothes or they showed too much of their skin or, I mean, just horrible, horrible realities. And yet, doing these things brings out a lot of the bad in American hegemony, which we see in the lower right corner, which were these horrible depictions of American torture of, of prisoners. And, you know, this, these are the things that create such negative uh, opinions of the United States. But Bush's effort to protect America from terrorists played out really well politically. In 2004, there's no question who the American people wanted uh, behind the, the wheel of power. Uh, Bush defeated a, a rather weak John Kerry as the candidate for the Democratic Party uh, to win a second term. But second terms aren't always fun, as Bill Clinton found out, and it's no different for Mr. Bush. As you can see here, the litany of things that just keep going wrong. And, um, and the problem was, uh, very similar to the Johnson administration. Uh, while I believe George Bush had a, um, a sort of uh, conservative and um, uh, f f sort of liberal economic agenda for the, for the United States, his war on terror distracted him and pulled him away from things that a lot of people are going to feel is, is just as important, if not more important. So Hurricane Katrina, which was a catastrophe, just made the president seem as if he were just out to lunch. Uh, there's a huge voter rebellion in, in, in um, 2006, which brought the first female Speaker of the House, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, Speaker Nancy Pelosi from uh, San Francisco, becomes the first woman to be the Speaker of the House. And this is going to completely stall uh, the Bush administration. There's going to be a number of investigations into what goes on. And then ultimately, of course, we get what's the beginning of the Great Recession. So uh, now the bottom fell out of the market in October of 2008. I don't know what it is about Octobers, but October is not a good month for the stock market for some reason. And so what began as a decline in home prices, which is very similar to the 1929 crash, by the way, ended up in a global economic crisis. So investment, investment accounts were crippled and blank, banks all over went, went into foreclosure with homes and, and, and then found themselves in bankruptcy. Um, and Congress is going to pass something called the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, which is going to now be referred to as the bank bailout. And it's going to amount to $700 billion in uh, asset transfers. And so um, this brings us to the election of 2008. So um, Bush's unpopularity in the American people with the American people gave the Democrats a, a, pure, uh, a true leg up in the 2008 election. So uh, the Republicans turned to one of the old standard bearers, John McCain. No question, good guy, war hero, and all the rest of it. Uh, he chooses a female running mate, Sarah Palin, the governor of Alaska. Uh, and, uh, and the Democrats themselves had internal struggles. Uh, was the party going to nominate the first woman? Or were they going to nominate the first African American? And the Clinton camp makes, in my opinion, a major miscalculation here. They really felt that it was basically her turn, and they weren't quite ready for the groundswell of support for the Obama administration and some of the uh, groundwork that the Obama people were doing in key states, in particular South Carolina. And... Um, uh, the Clintons found themselves uh, somewhat surprised when the nomination went to Barack Obama. And so, uh, in what is clearly the most 
socially historical political election of, of American history, really. The first African American is elected president of the United States. So the first 100 days of the no drama Obama administration, unemployment was soaring and the national debt rose over $10 trillion. So again, instead of being down to six, it was already up to $10 trillion, and it was only 2009. And the United States was involved in two wars. And uh, so uh, the problem, of course, is that people are more than willing to transfer their disgruntlement from one president to another. So from the, I mean, literally the moment George W. Bush leaves office, all of American uh, anxiety and hostility towards inactive and incompetent government is transferred to the new president. And so o Obama uh, really um, felt the pressure of the American people who started to question whether it was a smart idea to give uh, the White House to a guy who had really only been a senator for just a few years. And so... Uh, he had to work to prop up the uh, TARP program that was done, and he promised uh, Americans to help with the sluggish economy. And he decided to do this with a very traditional Keynesian model and what he referred to as shovel-ready projects that were going to rebuild American infrastructure across the country and put millions of people back to work. Now, um, this is going to cost... Uh, trillions of dollars. And so the, and, and I think it's important to note these words here, right? Trillion dollar deficits. So not trillion dollars in spending. This is just the borrowed amount. So the budget, which in 2008 was at 2.9 trillion, is going to jump to uh, three and a half, or over three uh, point nine trillion dollars. So almost a trillion dollars of debt added every year. And so in the eight years of the Obama administration, about uh, $10 trillion is going to be added to the national debt. And part of the problem for uh, Mr. Obama is that while his exuberance was uh, very encouraging, he had never stopped to realize just how slow the wheels of government actually work. And to get the federal government and the states to coordinate on massive infrastructure projects all over the country that were all in various degrees of preparation, his uh, multi-trillion dollar stimulus never really uh, amounted to much. In fact, he makes this uh, rather quippy remark, side note, during a, a conference where he said, well, I guess those shovel-ready projects weren't quite shovel-ready. Um, and so the other problem, again, in my opinion, is that uh, Obama addressed this new economic reality with the same mechanisms that FDR would have addressed it with. And while it's nice to think that you could take people who are unemployed and have them go work on, um, you know, highways and bridges and, and other types of public works projects, it's rather unrealistic to assume that somebody who was laid off from a bank is somehow going to forego his um, unemployment checks, which Obama extended to 99 weeks worth of benefits. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine somebody who's a white collar worker giving all that up and stop looking for a job and simply to go and take, uh, you know, refuge in a, in a job paving streets or, you know, digging and fixing potholes. And it just doesn't really affect the unemployment numbers. And in my opinion, sucking trillions of dollars out of the um, credit market for these projects really uh, dried up any potential borrowing that would have been done by private industry that would have created some real jobs. And what should have been a somewhat short recession ended up being the quote unquote great recession which, by the way, was a term that he made. Uh, he was asked if this was the beginning of another Great Depression, and he said, no, 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 we don't, you know, no, it's not the Depression, it's more like a Great Recession, and, and there's where, there's you got the term. And uh, 
and it's important also to note that the, the economic numbers had really fallen to their lowest level by 2009. And so uh, in, in some people's opinion, and I'm one of them, it, he really prolonged the recession rather than shortened it. Um, and so uh, what's really best known for his first two years, of course, is Obamacare or the um, Affordable Care Act. And so uh, this is probably the the biggest political investment of the Obama administration, and it probably affected uh, everything that happened after it. He had majorities in both houses. He felt that he had the moment to act, and he created a what I'm going to call halfway to socialist healthcare system, which um, really got sort of railroaded through the Congress. Uh, virtually nobody read it. We get the famous uh, quote from the Speaker Pelosi who said that, you know, if you want to know what's in the bill, you have to pass it first. Uh, 2,700 pages of legislation with a 300-page explanation of what's in the legislation. Virtually nobody reads it. And not a single Republican in the House or Senate votes for it. I don't remember that ever happening in my lifetime. Uh, and and so um, people on the far left who wanted a complete government takeover, they weren't happy. And people on the right who wanted the government to just stay out of it and leave it alone, they're certainly not happy. And it's the beginning of what we call the Tea Party movement. And in 2010, both houses of Congress go uh, to... Uh, the Republicans, and they're not going to ease up on uh, Mr. Obama and his administration at all. And so uh, we have attempts to regulate Wall Street, uh, and and here again we have um, a, I think we have an event of unintended consequences. This is, this is a situation where the government tried to shut the barn door after the horse left. You know, it's, um, uh, you know, in a response to this horrible market that was, I believe, created more by government policy than it was by private industry's uh, exuberance. Um, and they decided that they were going to put these banks under more uh, government control, whether they were commercial banks or retail banks or... or uh, financial institutions or insurance agencies. And so they started to create all of these new regulations. And while I think it was all with good intention to protect people's assets, it was really more about covering the government's asses. And so the idea here, um, I think, actually helped to further tighten the grip uh, uh, on... Um, on corporate assets. These, these are companies who are now going to be more terrified to act because they're now feeling more scrutiny from the government and are going to be less likely to invest in risky projects because they don't want to be seen as um, uh, creating too much uncertainty. And this, again, is a problem because you, know, you kind of need them to create some risks because that's how economies grow. And so uh, another aspect of this that um, kind of gets lost in the narrative presented by the authors um, who, as I said, are, are coming from a slightly different perspective than myself. Uh, there were a number of scandals that hit the, the um, Obama administration, just like it happened to George W. Bush and Bill Clinton and, you know, uh, you know Ronald Reagan. But in, uh, in the IRS, in the NSA, there were a number of situations where, you know, People had to draw into question whether the President of the United States was being entirely honest and if he wasn't necessarily going out after his enemies through IRS audits of, um, uh, of conservative organizations or the investigation of James Rosen, who was a reporter for Fox News, uh, you know, as a possible agent of foreign uh, uh, powers. And these are all things that are uh, somewhat troubling. The fact that the President of the United States is out there uh, using the IRS to, to go after uh, political opponents. And so in the foreign policy, uh, 
you know, Obama had entered office promising to get out of both Afghanistan and Iraq. And what happened, of course, is he tries to pull troops out, especially after the death of Osama bin Laden, and uh, which is probably the greatest accomplishment in foreign policy for Mr. Obama. And um, with the Arab awakening or Arab Spring, uh, I think that the Trump or excuse me, I'm sorry, the Obama administration got way ahead of itself, thinking that they were going to be there to sort of watch over the democratization of the Middle East. And in reality, it just created all kinds of power vacuums and um, violence that was really almost more destabilizing than it was under old dictatorial regimes. And so um, the United States uh, decides to bomb uh, Libya in order to uh, support the Arab Spring. And in that process, they are going to get rid of um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who in fact is, uh, you know, executed in a somewhat brutal manner, I would say. Not that he deserved any kind of like um, special treatment, but, uh, you know, so uh, this, however, created an enormous power vacuum in Libya that still exists today. And this allowed for... Um, uh, uh, this allowed for Islamic extremists to start getting a foothold in, in North Africa. And, um, you know, this was a, a catastrophe in the United States, and, and uh, this is going to lead to the horrific attack on an American consulate in Benghazi, Libya, that still to this day, I don't know that people really understand just how horrible and horrific it was and what a terrible performance by the United States State Department uh, under, under Hillary Clinton. And so when Syria started to um, uh, lay down the hammer on their own Arab Spring, uh, Barack Obama made yet another naive move he goes out into public and essentially threatens uh, Basar Assad of uh, Syria that any gas attacks on his own people would be a, quote, red line in Syria or, and that the United States would do something about it. Now, uh, if any of you have ever uh, been in a playground where, you know, kind of taunting will happen as a little kid, you learn pretty fast that if you're going to make threats, you better be ready to live up to them because uh, if not, you're going to get a bloody nose. And that is exactly what happens. Um, the uh, uh, Syrian regime uh, gasses its own people. Clearly, it's what happens. And instead of doing something about it, Obama is forced to go out in public and somehow explain why he really didn't mean what he meant and that it was really just supposed to be a kind of a, I don't know, suggestion that he shouldn't be such a bad person. Um, and th this creates a lot of problems because it created the perception that the United States was not willing to live up to its threats. And this manifests itself again in Crimea. Crimea was a, a part of the Ukraine. And I think it's very interesting to, to note that back in the 1990s, Russia, the United States, Britain, and France had go, approached the Ukrainians uh, because they had the third largest uh, supply of nuclear weapons. And because we were all somewhat afraid that a dictator in uh, Ukraine could someday get a little crazy and start throwing nuclear weapons around, or worse, uh, sell nuclear materials and weapons to um, uh, nefarious groups, we were able to negotiate with Ukraine to give up those weapons. Uh, I believe it was 1994. And in this treaty, Ukraine gave up its weapons in exchange for a guarantee of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, meaning that the boundaries of Ukraine as they existed in the 1990s were the internationally recognized boundaries of Ukraine. And Russia signed on to that treaty. So when Russia invaded Crimea, it was a clear violation of that treaty, and it was a violation of international law 
about aggression towards independent states. And yet, we did nothing. And we did more than nothing. We denied the Ukrainians access to American weapons to simply defend themselves. And this was uh, really kind of... uh, uh, the beginning of the end because now the Chinese start to channel inter, uh, challenge international norms. They start to um, uh, arrest and intern uh, Muslim Uyghurs in the western parts of China. They start to do even more uh, surveillance of, of American, or I should say Western companies operating in China to steal technology and to undermine uh, their um, patents and copyrights. So when... Um, he gets into his second term in office. Uh, you know, he's uh, really forced into a position where he can't even get anything through the Congress. And so he makes his famous, I have a pen and a phone comment and decides to start running the country through executive orders and starts to um, attack the Tea Party as a group of uh, radical uh, people which is, you know, somewhat amazing. But, however, uh, the conservatives started to get a resurgence in the government. And the uh, Black Lives Matter is a somewhat interesting uprising as well because um, the assumption on the part of, I think, just about everybody was that the election of, of the first black president of the United States was going to somehow invoke a feeling as if there was a great accomplishment in civil rights and that we were really talking about a more equitable society. And yet Black Lives Matter emerges after an unarmed black man is is shot by police in Ferguson, Missouri. And, you know, Obama is in this now what I would call almost surreal position where he's functioning in a in in a country where a black president is perceived as not doing enough to help black people it's it's an unusual uh, reality so terrorism in the united states in places like fort hood and, and orlando shooting and san bernardino uh th- this is now a real implosion because wh- where do you find haven um you know, can you, uh, if, if you could get attacked in a military base by f- uh, foreign terrorists or by um, uh, Muslim sympathizers in Orlando in, in, in a, um, a nightclub, I mean, or even a, a company uh, a party as it was in San Bernardino, I mean, these are really very frightening things. So Occupy Wall Street also becomes another issue. These are mostly young people who believe that the quote unquote 99% are, um, you know, uh, basically taking advantage of the, the or excuse me, the 99% are being uh, abused and uh, essentially victimized by the elite 1% of the country. And they start to uh, march in the streets all over the place trying to, um, you know, I don't know whatever it was. It was somewhat interesting. I talked and met with some members of the Occupy Wall Street movement, and what I found really interesting, it was in a meeting with a um, with a a liberal gay Democratic city councilman who who just at one point said, "Well, what is it that you would like us to do? Like, what what is it that you would like us to help you with?" and there just was this lack of our of our articulation of exactly what it was that they wanted and one of the reasons why i think the wall street the occupy wall street movement lost some of its juice is that it really didn't seem to have a point uh, and that's very hard to push in politics if you don't have a set uh list of things that you want done right and so politics became even more pol- polarized when in 2008, I feel that the the aspirations of the country was that the that we were all going to be coming together. So um, this starts to be articulated in the uh, media, and uh, I know the textbook and and others like to focus on Fox, which is uh, you know sort of sticks out as a sore thumb because of its singularity in terms of conservative journalism. 
but it, it's really across the board. Um, MSNBC, CNN, all these other places. Uh, if you look at the list of people who are their commentators, many of them are former members of the uh, of the um, uh, Clinton and um, Obama administrations. And in Fox, it's mostly former Bush people. And it's just sort of bizarre to think that um, that they could go on with this and, and assume that Americans aren't going to get that they're um, being biased. And the part of the problem here is that we have blended what was always existed, which was opinion and editorial work, which in newspapers is very easy because it's done on a separate page of the paper, in social media and in um, television and cable, it's a lot harder to do that. So when you have a news broadcast that's only, say, 20 minutes of airtime, um, what they chose to put on the news and how they chose to display it uh, really speaks of a bias and the fact that um, there's not a more open acknowledgement by a media that they are, in fact, pushing agendas is what makes it so much more um, uh, sort of uh, troubling, right? So Obama tries to make these bold decisions to kind of get America moving in the right place. And, you know, this is in things like, you know, supporting gay marriage and, you know, supporting... Um, uh, transgender bathrooms or whatever it is that you you want to put out there, right? These are all really bold initiatives that have to be done. And of course, ending the the ban on uh, gay serving in the military, right? These are all really positive and powerful things. And so um, what becomes important for Mr. Obama is that the Supreme Court upholds Obamacare, uh, even though it was... Um, uh, it, and it depended on the vote of the... Um, Chief Justice, who was a George W. Bush nominee to the court, you know, John Roberts. And um, so this became uh, a very big deal. So when the court rules in favor of, um, of Obamacare, everybody thought that this is going to, um, you know, end it all. But nope, it just made it kind of worse, right? So where are we now? Uh, oh, boy. Um Donald Trump, uh, to call him a disruptor is um, is this understatement of the century. Um, now, Hillary Clinton becomes the first woman nominated by a major party to be president. She's not the first woman to be nominated by any party. Uh, there had been a couple of them. Uh, and, of, and of course, in 2016, Jill Stein will be nominated by the Green Party in 2016, excuse me, to, to run f for president as well. Um, and I think it's fair to say that both of these candidates were extremely uh, faulty. And both of them had significant credibility issues. And uh, while Hillary uh, wins the popular vote, which is mostly from my state, California, uh, Donald Trump uh, carried rather comfortably, the, the Electoral College. And it's a miscue that's going to be up for history. I'm telling you, it's going to be one of the most studied things that we're going to see for a very long time because most of the media and pretty much all of the pundits had it wrong. And it's, it's, it's really going to be pretty significant. What they talk about is the Twitter effect. Social media has definitely changed politics. The fact that people can go and get a meme and push it through... Uh, through millions and millions, if not billions of people before anyone has an opportunity to edit and make sure that the information is correct, really is something that we should all take a deep breath and try to get a grip on. But it definitely helped uh, Mr. Trump in the 2016 election. And so this, uh, what will refer to the race to the bottom in personal politics is now what we're dealing with today. And so with, um, with the media getting it so wrong still, it's, it's really very troubling because we need desperately a viable and a credible media. 
uh, and we can only hope, right, that this can can uh, help. Uh, and r- really, what uh, the lesson I think out of the Obama administration is how someone could be so personally popular. I mean, I don't know how you not like Barack Obama. I mean, how do you not like him? I mean, good looking, nice family man, you know, good singer. You know what I mean? Like he's just a nice, nice guy. But his policies were just really rejected by such a large number of people. And uh, the inability to understand that dynamic really has had a negative effect. And with that, we come to the end, at least of this uh, course and um, saga. I have great hope for the future. I think that this country still has so many positive things to learn and do and grow. I hope that you feel the same. I want to thank you very much for your participation in the class and for your patience in going through these sometimes long narratives. And I hope to see you uh, join me in my early American history course, if it's being available again soon. And this is uh, Don D'Angelo, adjunct professor for Grossmont Community College and Maricosta College, signing off. And my very best wishes to everybody. Bye-bye.